Yeah. Okay. How y'all doing? Um, today, my name is Eric Kane, and today I'm going to be presenting my topic on the topic of black magic. Okay, so now throughout history, anywhere that there was black or indigenous aboriginal people, you can find a culture that believes, studied, and practiced magic. From the pharaohs, priests, and everyday people of Egypt, the witch doctors, the shamans in sub-Saharan Africa, the mantrics of ancient Egypt, India, the magi of Mesopotamia, the shamans of Ruggeria of Mesoamerica, the Moorish knights and knights Templar, the, the occupied Spain and Europe, and the voodoo and hoodoo queens and kings of the, of the American South, magic has always not only been a staple of, of, of black culture, but a part of it. I mean, but the basis of it. So magic, right now, uh, from the Oxford Dictionary, is defined as the power of apparently influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. Okay, so my personal definition for, ma uh, for magic from everything that I've studied so far is turning imagination into reality. Imagination uh, broken down is I, the power comes from within, magic, which was already previously defined, and the suffixation, which is the act of creation of. So imagination is the act of creation of ma uh, magic that comes from within, and the you, oops, see, by the way. I think it's the back here on the left. I do. Yeah. Just, yeah, just tap it. Oh, I think underneath it, if there's a, time to get, hit that, that icon right underneath it. That should take you back. Oh, oh yeah. shit. Back. Here. <laughs> I'm not even happy. Sorry about that. Yeah, should I stop? I'm just sleeping. Okay, you're back. <laughs> you can edit it. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Okay, so the use of personal willpower in order to make the impossible possible and to take thought and make it into reality. Okay, so according to Britannica's article on magic, there are two types of magic. Magic is sometimes divided into the high magic of the intellectual elite bordering on science and the low or natural magic of the common folk practices. Natural magic was used by everyday people for everything ranging from small household spells and apothecary, which was the use of root work and potions and medicine, to more complex things like healing, communicating with the ancestors and spirits. Household divinations, which used tea leaves, tarot, uh, psychic readings, and communicating with animals, voodoo, plant magic, candle workers, crystal magic, and much more. High magic was reserved for the magical authority of the civilization and culture, whether that be the pharaohs, priests, priestesses, oracles, warlocks, shamans, the medieval royal courts, and the church clergy, which included the pope and his bishops. High magic includes, but is not limited to, astrology, neoplatonic magic, alchemy, high alchemy, metaphysics, sorcery, and hermetic divination, which was not only trying to uh, predict the future, but attempting to control and alter it. Uh, magic versus religion. According to Britannica's online encyclopedia, religion, according to seminal anthropologist Sir Edward Burnett, uh, Burnett Tyler, involves a direct personal relationship between humans and spiritual forces. In religion's highest form, that relationship is with a personal, conscious, omnipotent spiritual being. Magic, on the other hand, is characterized as external, impersonal, and mechanical, involving technical acts of power. Magic seeks to manipulate spiritual powers while religious, uh, while religious prayer supplicates spiritual forces. The distinction explored by Bronislaw Malis Malinowski. 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 Uh, 1884 to 1942, in his work on the Tr uh, Tr Trobrian Islanders. Both magic and religion acknowledge the existence of unseen forces as the science that control uh, and govern the laws of nature. The difference between magic and religion is that religion sees these forces as divine sources, or a god, that must be revered and worshiped in order for miracles to happen. Magic sees these same forces as tools for the user to wield to its benefit and requires no worship at all for its miracles to manifest. Religion and magic are closely related and are entwined in many ancient cultures. Magic versus science. According to the same article, although magic is similar in, in some respects to science and technology, it approaches efficacy, the ability to produce a desired material outcome differently. Magic, like religion, is concerned with invisible, non-empirical forces, 
Yet, like science, it also makes claims to efficacy. Unlike science, which measures outcomes through empirical and experimental means, magic involves a symbolic cause-effect relationship. So while science can measure both the cause and effect of an event, magic can only scientifically record the effect while the cause of said event is much more abstract. And while it can be identified, it cannot properly be measured. Magic and science are also closely related. In fact, most of the sciences we study now have their origins in some sort of form of magic, like alchemy and chemistry. Oh, well, y'all missed all my pictures, but I don't, I don't feel like going back. Ancient Egypt is regarded by many scholars as the birthplace of civilization, and to whom we owe much of our knowledge, learning, history, and religions, too. Magic was not just a big part of Egyptian culture, it was Egyptian culture. Of course, as John Henry Clark proved years ago, the ancient Egyptians were black. According to Joshua J. Mark on worldhistory.org, magic in ancient Egypt was not a parlor trick or illusion. It was harnessing of the powers of natural laws conceived of as supernatural entities in order to achieve a certain goal. To the Egyptians, a world without magic was inconceivable. It was through magic that the world had been created, magic sustained the world daily, magic healed when one was sick, gave when one had nothing, and assured one of the eternal life after death. The Egyptologist James Henry Breasted has family, famously uh, remarked how magic infused every aspect of ancient Egyptian life and was, quote, as much a matter of, of course as sleep or the preparation of food. Meaning, of course, it was so prevalent in everyday life for me that you couldn't escape it. In order to help classify the forces that were constantly being manipulated, the Egyptians created the system. Forces were given characteristics and then classified as gods, hundreds of them. However, the Egyptians were not polytheistic. They believed in one overarching god, but they believed that the lesser beings or forces had dominion over the lesser forces that, uh, that dominated the physical plane. They also used symbols as visual representations of how a force should act or as a code to allude to them so that they could use them to communicate to others who practice as well. For example, if you want to add two things together, you would draw a plus symbol. Anyone who knows mathematics knows that a formula, knows that's a formula, and knows what to do when they see it. So in order to understand Egyptian magic, you have to be able to understand Egyptian mythology and symbolism. So magic in Egyptian society. Um, this is, uh, quote from Stephanie Schaubert on the, his, uh, on the history collection. Um, at first, uh, I stated at first the people who controlled the magic were only the priests, and the quote states, uh, they were the guardians of the knowledge bestowed upon humans by the gods so that they could ward off the negative hands of fate. There were different levels of priests, but it was elected priests who were able to read the ancient magic texts that possessed the greatest magic. Elected priests were in charge of protecting the ruler and guiding the dead on the path to rebirth. There was also healing priests who could ward off the plague and lower priests who could rid the city of reptiles and insects. <laughs> Which sounds, you know, curiously like the story of Moses. Exactly. Eventually, magic was used by the majority of the people in the kingdom. There were sects and cults dedicated to different gods, and each sect would study a different path. One might join the sect of Isis to learn divin uh, divination and sorcery. By the first millennium BC, magic was no longer only in the hands of the priests. It fell to the magicians and witches who then could control magic to help the people. Midwives and nurses were said to have magic about them to help the sick and women in childbirth. It was also written that wise women, uh, wise women might that wise women might be consulted if a ghost or deity was believed to be causing trouble for someone. No matter the time, magic played a major role in Egyptian society. Those who touted themselves as magicians with the ability to wield magic did so by connecting uh, themselves with a certain god. It was this god that would grant them power and would be the focus of their ma uh, magic. Shock it again. Mm -hmm. Now, magic tools. Yeah, I bought some of my, my little crystals uh, over there on the table. But amulets were extremely common, and thousands of them have been recovered at grave sites. They were made of crystals and minerals and were used to ground one's energy or give protection from evil spirits. Jade, jasper, copper, silver, gold, etc. They would wear them as necklaces, anklets, bracelets, etc. Wands. By the second century BC, wands were being used to help with spell work. Most wands were made of ivory. They would use them to do things like draw protective circles around the sick and childbearing and to combat other magicians. And some of the priests actually used staffs. A 
of the Board of Noble Woman Sitzerbeck, alive, sound and healthy. The exact use of the wand is unknown and of course is open to debate, but due to the iconography of words engraved onto them, they seem to have provided protection primarily during birth and in early life, when a human is most vulnerable. They are also placed in tombs to offer protection to the deceased on their rebirth. But were they just symbolic carved objects to carry around, or were they used in some kind of ritual? Why do some look so worn? We know there were metal wands representing the snake god great of magic and were carried by some magic practitioners. The more common semicircular ivory wands were used particularly in the 2nd century BC. It is believed that wands were symbols of authority of the magician to summon powerful beings and to make them obey him or her. Magic was incredibly important in ancient Egypt. The term they used to describe magic was Heka. Not dissimilar to the Force in the Star Wars franchise. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I, you know, that video is like 10 minutes long, so I didn't want to do the whole thing. Magic tools continued. You had glyphs, which were symbols and hieroglyphics uh, were used in order to draw out longer and more complicated spells. Families would also create spells and pass them down by inscribing uh, the glyphs on things like pots and papers. Um, which are, they would pass them down, it's kind of like you feel, we pass down recipes nowadays. Mm -hmm. you feel me? So spells would stay within the family. This is how a lot of people have the, the, you feel me, the vocal, uh, uh, the, verbal, the verbal application of magic and a lot of this stuff wasn't written down because it was passed down. Mm -hmm. right. Cauldrons, um, cauldrons were used to mix different roots and herbs to make potions. Most of them came with a grinder to help crush and mix them together. They would even use them to make psychedelics and other things that uh, we would consider drugs. Mm -hmm. This is where the myths of potions develop. The same things that all of our grandparents used to do. Right. Um, here, is, uh, here is another pot with, uh, you feel me, this is another pot that they were used to brew, actually brew alcohol. Um, and, well, thank you. that's on my next slide. Magical herbs. The Egyptians were getting high as hell. As I stated <laughs> earlier, inside the cauldrons, they would crush up different herbs, including, but not limited to, marijuana, cocaine, tobacco, poppy, and other different drugs. They would also use giant mixing pots to brew alcohol and rum. Alcohol was one of the main things brewed using alchemy. And these, were done, these were done for spiritual and ceremonial reasons. They would get into an, ine an inebriated, intoxicated state in order to better channel the gods that they were trying to channel. This is why we still refer to alcohol as spirits today. Marijuana was also used to ease childbirth to help with pain, and the Egyptians were the first to use it to treat glaucoma. Here's a short one. Yeah. Oh, they are actually. Start to see the similarities in Christianity. <laughs> oh, I touch on that. I touch on that too. So. And it, yeah, certainly with feminine health. No doubt about that. And Isis, Ishtar, Absolutely. Right. Right. Easter. Right. All of it. It becomes so overwhelming when you start to sort of see all of these similarities mm -hmm. and Okay, so here it says it's the spiritual and ceremonial uses the funeral rituals of ancient Egyptians may be the most well-known of all ancient societies. Process of mummification of burying, of burying notable figures with their valuable belongings. Let me go a little quick because I'm running out of time. Traces of cannabis have also been discovered in ancient Egyptian mummies. For example, a number of studies from the 1990s discovered traces of THC, the psychoactive compound in cannabis, and several and remains of several mummies. One mummy who was believed to have uh, been buried in 950 BCE had a significant deposit of THC along with nicotine and cocaine in its tissues. <laughs> the highest concentrations of THC were found in the lungs, suggesting that cannabis smoke was inhaled by the ancient person. Cannabis smoke may have been used in spiritual or ceremonial rituals or as medicinal applications for a number of illnesses and ailments. So this is kind of where this culture, now y'all can y'all start to see where this culture is starting to come from. Amun Ra or Amun Re. The word Amun means the hidden or the hiddenness of divinity, whereas Re means the sun or the divinity and the power of the sun. The god Amun Re is a representation of those two ideas, the ever present invisible power and the radiant light of the divine force that sustains life. 
Museum of Canada. Amun Ra was a combination of the universal sun god Ra and the hidden creator god Amun. Amun Ra literally translates to the hidden sun that uh, that's uh, the hidden sun that's energy sustains the universe. The hidden sun is divine solar energy, and solar is equivalent to solar, as in your soul. Right. The hidden sun is your soul. Amun Ra represents God, and God sits on the throne in the seats of our souls. The symbol of Ra is the all-seeing and all-knowing eye, or the all-seeing and all-knowing eye. The eye represents the creator in all of his glory, therefore I am the creator. We end our prayers, which, is, which at the basis of it are just magical requests to whatever deity we serve, with the phrase, Amen. When Moses asks God's name in the Bible, he declares, I am that I am, or I am that I am. We learn that in order to make miracles happen, that you have to have faith, but faith in whom? If I am is God, wouldn't that mean that in order to make the magic work, you must have faith that I am is going to take care of it, which means you must believe in yourself first in order for it to work. Hmm. Very interesting. Now we have Tahuti, Jehudi, or Thoth. Thoth is one of the most important figures in ancient Egypt. He is said to be the one who taught the high arts and magic to the Egyptians. He sits beside Ra on a journey across the waters of Nun. Thoth was said to have been the first pharaoh of Egypt, and his reign lasted for over 10,000 years. According to the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum, Thoth was the god of the of the moon, sacred text, mathematics, and sciences, magic, messenger and reporter of the deities, master of knowledge, patron of the scribes. His Egyptian name was Jehudi, which means he who is like the Ibis, he is depicted as an Ibis bird of the baboon. According to one story, Thoth was born of the lips of Ra at the beginning of creation, was known as the god without a mother. In another story, Thoth is self-created at the beginning of time. And as an ibis lays the cosmic egg that holds all of creation, he was always closely associated with Ra, and the concept of divine order and justice, thought was created, uh, credited with creating the art of writing, inventing the calendar, controlling space and time. Since he was the god of the moon, he had celestial functions and replaced the sun god Ra in the sky at night. If Amun Ra was the god that represented the source of divine energy or the soul, then Thoth was thought. This is why thought represents the moon. While the soul is ever illuminated like an eternal sun, your thoughts are birthed from darkness. Close your eyes and think, and what do you see? So if we read it again or replace thought with thought, thought was the god of the moon, sacred text, mathematics, sciences, hmm. magic, messenger and recorder of deities, master of knowledge, and patron of the scribes. His Egyptian name was Jehudi, blah, 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 blah. Thought was, created, was credited with creating the art of writing, inventing the calendar, controlling space and time. Since he was the god of the moon, he was the celestial force. So thought equals thought, which is where, the, which is where imagination comes in. Next we have Heka. Heka was not just the god of magic, he was magic itself. In fact, if one wanted to cast a spell, the words that he would speak or the incantation would be considered Heka. Heka claims his primordial power standing to me belong the universe before you gods came into being. You have come afterwards because I am Heka. After creation, Heka sustained the world as the power which gave gods their abilities. Even the gods feared him, and in the words of Egyptologist Richard H. Wilkinson, he was viewed as the god of inestimable power. This power was evident in one's daily life. The world operated as, as it did because of the gods, and the gods were able to perform their duties because of Heka. Heka was said to be how Amun Ra, or Ptah, whatever um, dynasty you, you, uh, you, you study, created the universe. He spoke it into existence. Speech creates sound, and sound creates vibration. Vibration indicates movement, and move, movement indicates time and space. Once time and space are created, there is a medium for existence to become itself. Now that there is space, something can move throughout that dark space. I.e., and God said, let there be light, and there was light. The universe was spoken into existence. This is why magic spells often had to be chanted before they were able to be used. Heka literally translates to of the ka, or of the spirit, insinuating that magic at its source hails from the spirit, which we already understand to be Amun Ra. Next, we have Isis and Osiris. Isis represents the divine feminine, the moon, the great mother, mother earth, and yin energy. Osiris represents the sacred masculine, the evening star, Sirius, which is lined up with the great pyramid, and the sky father, which, um, which, which was the lord of the spiritual realm or the underworld, and he represents gang energy. Though in order to create magic or anything, the Egyptians believed that you had to combine the feminine and masculine energies. You had to be able to manifest the spirit on the physical plane. This is how any sort of spell worked. The abbreviated myth goes that Isis and Osiris were king and queen of Egypt. 
Osiris was killed by his brother Seth and cut into many pieces scattered throughout the world. Isis went to find all the pieces and found every piece but his penis. As she cried over the body of her husband, his spirit came in and impregnated her, and she became pregnant by divine insemination. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. And unto them no. a child was born. Right. No. That child's name was Horus or Heru. Heru was stated to be the child of Isis and represents us. Heru was said to be the heir to the throne of Egypt and eventually would take the place as Ra as the god of the universe. But until then, he had the battle set, which represented his lower nature, so he could better access and tap into the spiritual realm, which we know is the source of Heka, which is magic itself. Once he defeats his lower nature, he becomes God and takes his throne and the ability to speak things into existence through the aid of thought, which is powered by the soul. Uh, does this sound familiar as well? From Britannica's Encyclopedia, Horus, Egyptian or Har, Hair, or Heru, in ancient Egyptian religion, a god in the form of a falcon whose right eye was the sun or the morning star, representing power and quintessence, whose left eye was the moon or the evening star, representing healing. So let's make a few connections. Heru, which was the Egyptian god that took over for Ra as the king of the gods, was represented by the morning star. Next from Heru, you have Hero, which was the main character of an epic novel, or the hero, um, which I got from The Hero's Journey from Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. Heracles, the son of a god and a mortal woman, spirit and uh, physical, who had to go through trials, who had to fight set, to eventually gain immortality or godhood. Next you have Hesu from Heru, you have Hesu, which you know in Spanish, Jesus is Jesus. Absolutely. Revelations 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Uh -huh. and we know that Heru was represented by the morning star. <laughs> Esu was the Yeruban God who was a direct messenger for the Almighty, just as Jesus came as a messenger for God the Father. Then you have Eshu Elegbara, which is Isu represented in Haitian Vudun, Elegwa, which is Ishu represented in Santeria, and Papa Legba, the God of the Guardian of the Spirit World and Hoodoo traditions. In order to invoke him, you would have to meet him at the crossroads, just as you meet Jesus at the cross. So for a recap, I am, you must first believe in yourself and every religion preaches, preaches faith, thoughts, use your imagination, speech, speak it into existence, action, you must combine, you must combine the spirit with physical action, then it becomes generation. Once these elements are combined, you can create something new, male plus female equals baby. These elements are found in literally every religious system. System In Abrahamic religions, we are told to ask and it shall be given. Seeking you shall find. Knocking the door shall be opened unto you. It also says faith without works is dead. The law of attraction and new age thought teaches the same exact thing. The law of attraction is attributed to the Greek god Hermes Trismegistus, who Britannica's encyclopedia states was one and the same with thought. The seven hermetic principles were the foundations of the enlightenment period in Europe where the new age teachings like the law of polarity, the law of vibration, the law of attraction, the law of universal oneness hail. And where do these ideas originate? The answer is black magic, which was the basis of all religion, religious and scientific structures here on this planet. So in conclusion, not only is magic a huge part of our history that we do not acknowledge, magic is black culture. Many of you may still recognize elements of the system within the African American community today. You ask, uh, many people still wear crystals for protection. You still use herbs for healing. You still believe in channeling spirits. Just go to a black church and let a really good song or sermon come on. The reason we look around and we feel like we have no real cultural identity here in America was because through hundreds of years of witch hunts, trials, and through our first a forced conversion to Christianity, we were taught to suppress this culture. So we hid within religion. We will never be able to completely revert back to our old culture until we embrace this as our identity. Sometimes we have to study the past and uncover its secrets in order to truly move forward as a people and as a culture and as a community. And there is my work site. <laughs>